Can you hear me? All right, good evening, church. It's good to be here with you guys tonight. Um, we are continuing our Baptist uh, Faith and Message series. Tonight we're on sections 6 and 8. Uh, combining them like that, they are the church and the Lord's Day. Uh, we're combining them like that because the Lord's Day um, is, is part of what the, the, the church believes, but also when the church meets and when the church gathers. And so uh, as we look at this tonight, we'll have six points um, to, to kind of summarize, hopefully, uh, these two big, uh, deep statements that the Baptist Faith and Message put together for us, uh, that the Southern Baptist Convention put together for us, that we believe. Um, and so for the sake of time, I'm not going to read that whole thing. You all have, uh, hopefully, those pamphlets uh, or the booklets. If you don't, then they're out in the foyer. You can grab one and, uh, and look through that. You can look to, to those sections and see exactly what they say uh, concerning these two sections that we're going to go over to tonight. Uh, the church is a big deal to talk about, and I'm, I'm glad that we're doing this series, and I'm glad that I get to preach on, on this uh, particular topic, uh, because there's a lot of confusion about what a church is. There's a lot of questions about what makes a church, uh, how do churches function, uh, there's all these different denominations, so how do we know what to believe, how do we know what, uh, what our church even believes, and so uh, it's good for us to, to be doing this, it's good for us to be thinking uh, deeply about these things. So I hope that tonight this really helps you as, uh, as, a, as a member of the Southern Baptist Church or maybe as a visitor to, um, to learn more about what it is that we believe here at First Baptist Church Faraday concerning the church. I'm going to open us up in a word of prayer and then we'll, we'll get started. Father God, thank you so much for your church. God, thank you that you sent Jesus to die on a cross and, and pay the, the price that the, the church should have paid. God, we thank you that now in Christ we have forgiveness of sins, that we have reconciliation with you. And Lord, I pray that tonight as we, uh, as we study uh, this, this topic of the church, that you would be growing our faith, that you would be um, helping us even to commit more to become uh, a church, commit ourselves and submit ourselves to the church and uh, gather regularly as the church. Father, would you get glory tonight? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So to summarize uh, kind of both of these sections, uh, I came up with a, uh, like Matt did kind of last week, a, a big run-on sentence. Uh, thanks, Matt, for the inspiration there. Uh, this, is, this is what I think these two points can be summarized as. The church is made up of one, autonomous local congregations who, two, observe the two ordinances of Christ, three, seeking to fulfill the Great Commission, four, as we are led by pastors and deacons, five, gathering together on the Lord's Day, six, as a whole consisting of all true believers throughout all time. That's a big statement. The Baptist Faith and Message has a really long thing there that you can read, and I'm trying to summarize that. that that's what we're going to go with. We have six points tonight. The first point is autonomous local congregations. If you have a Bible and want to flip to 1 Peter chapter 5, you can. This is where we're going to kind of get our first uh, dive into this first point. Autonomous local congregations, uh, it really just means that, that we believe as the Southern Baptist, as a Southern Baptist church, that, uh, that churches ought to be self-governed. Uh, now, now we, and, and so that means that we have authority. We have authority to make big decisions like who we're going to hire and fire and church membership and church discipline, uh, who's going to be in the church, who's not going to be, how we're going to do the Lord's Supper, how we're going to do baptisms, all of those type of things. Um, and, and that is operating, we are operating under the authority of Christ. So even while we are self-governed, we are, we are doing all of this in, in obedience to Jesus' lordship as, as our ultimate authority. There are uh, some churches who don't, who don't think that way. They, they um, instead have uh, elders or bishops or people over the church or over multiple churches. And so what they do is they, um, they come together 
and they have uh, they elect these these elders to meet together, and then they uh, they help to make decisions. And so even um, you know the Methodist church down the street, the pastor he's he's a he's a new guy there. He's a good guy. We were having a conversation this week, and as we just got to talking, he was saying. You know, man, I just started. I've been there for about a month, and I, I hope that I'm there for a while. But uh, reality is, they could, they could, you know, if another church needs me more or whatever, then then uh, the United Methodist Church can say, hey, instead of you being there, we're gonna we're gonna send you to another church in the state. Um, as a Southern Baptist church, we we don't believe that we do that. We we would uh, we we hire Josh Green or Josh Womble or or Matt or Jake, and and the church votes, and so the authority lies with within the church. We would. We would do that, not um, kind of a governing body over over us. Um, yeah, and so in First Peter, uh, if you have your Bible, First Peter chapter five, look at verse two. Peter's saying, "Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under, under compulsion, but willingly." The language here of 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 Shepherding the flock that is among you means the people that you're gathering with, the people that you're around. You're not shepherding a flock that is in Lexington or in Cincinnati, but, but the people here, the people that are, that are among you. You're to shepherd those people. Uh, in, in Acts chapter 14, we get uh, similar language. You don't have to flip there. You can just take down the reference. Verse 23 in Acts chapter 14 says, And when they had appointed elder, elders for them in every church... With prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So in every church, they were appointing elders. Why? Because those elders were going to be the leaders of that church, not of multiple churches or other churches. And so as the Southern Baptist Church, First Baptist Church Faraday believes that we, um, that the church has the authority, that the church is uh, autonomous, we govern ourselves under the governing laws and, and lordship of Christ. That's point one. But all of these churches in the Southern Baptist Convention, we, uh, we believe and observe uh, two ordinances of Christ, the two ordinances of Christ, which are baptism and the Lord's Supper. This is our second point. The church is made up of autonomous local congregations who observe the two ordinances of Christ. The first is, is baptism. I think we know what baptism is, but in case you don't, it's, it's an outward expression of an inward change, is an easy way to say it. It's an outward expression of the believer saying, I have died to my old self, and now I'm being raised to new life with Christ. Uh, in Ephesians 2, it says that you, uh, you were dead in your sins, but God made you alive in Christ. And whenever someone gets baptized... In the baptistry here at Ferdo, we believe that just as Christ died and rose again to new life, so we also have died to our old selves and been raised to new life. Second Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. And so we believe that, uh, that if you are a believer in Christ, you're no longer who you once were, but you're, you're now God is making you new, God has made you new, and, and baptism is a representation of that. Bobby Jameson puts it this way. Uh, it's a really good, uh, really good way to put baptism in his book called Understanding Baptism. I'm going to quote him here again in a second because he has another book called Understanding the Lord's Supper. Uh, if you're interested in those, go check those out. But uh, concerning the baptism, he says, Baptism is a church's act of affirming and portraying a believer's union with Christ by immersing him or her in water, and a believer's act of publicly committing him or herself to Christ and his people, thereby uniting a believer to the church and marking off him or her from the world. That's a pretty good definition of what baptism is. It's a church's act, but it's also a believer's act. Uh, it's, it's not a, it's, so, so we would say it's not something that can be done outside of the church where the church is not represented. Uh, we, don't, we don't think that organizations that are not considered the church should be baptizing folks. We think that that should be done uh, as the church, under the authority of the church, uh, again, as we submit to Christ. Um, but it's, it's, it's happening, it's, it's both the church and the believer um, that, that are doing something there. The church is affirming and and portraying a believer's union with Christ while the believer is publicly committing themselves to Christ. 
Whenever Josh Green, uh, he typically does our baptisms here in the, at the church, and whenever he baptizes somebody, you'll notice, if you've been here long enough, that whenever someone gets baptized, he turns to them and says, what is your profession of faith? Right? And they say, Jesus is Lord every time. Right? Because it's, it's a believer showing, Jesus is my Lord, I'm, I'm, I, I've died to my old self, God's made me new. And, and now as a church, we're all looking on and Josh is, is baptizing them and we're saying, we, we believe that that person is a new creation. And we're affirming that in them. And, and, uh, and we believe that that's, that's the way baptism uh, should, should carry itself out. In John 3, 23, again, you don't have to flip there um, unless you want to. John 3, 23, we get an example of what baptism is. Uh, it says in verse 23, John also was baptizing at Anon near Salim because water was plentiful there. Water was plentiful there. Whenever Jesus got baptized, you'll, uh, in, in Mark chapter 1, uh, it says that he came up out of the water. Uh, and so uh, we don't want to get too caught up about words, but we believe that baptism is, is something that you have, to be fully, you have to be fully immersed in water. We don't believe that, you, uh, that, that sprinkling is baptism by, by virtue of the word baptize. Uh, baptizo means to immerse in, in the Greek. And so we believe that someone has to be fully immersed in water, which means that, uh, that, there are, um, that we would disagree with churches who think that babies, for example, could be, um, could be sprinkled or that people, adults, could be sprinkled. Um, and, and also because infants can't publicly commit themselves to Christ, we would say uh, that is not a practice that, that we will do. Uh, here at First Baptist Ferdo, we believe that someone has to commit themselves to Christ publicly and be fully immersed in water. The Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is um, uh, whenever Jesus instituted it in Luke chapter 20, uh, sorry, 22, uh, 14 through 23. He says, he gives them the cup, and he says, sorry, he gives them the bread. And he took bread, and when he gave it, he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. So we believe that the Lord's Supper, whenever we uh, eat the bread or the wafer and, and drink the, the juice, that, that those are representative of Christ. They're representative of his body and of his blood, uh, his crucifixion on the cross, where his, his body was broken for us, his blood was poured out for us, for our sins, so that we could be right with God. And, and the, Lord's Supper, uh, the Lord's Supper is symbolic of that. Again, Bobby Jameson on the Lord's Supper says that the Lord's Supper is a church's act of communing with Christ. We together are communing with Christ and each other when we take the Lord's Supper. And commemorating Christ's death by partaking of bread and wine or juice and a believer's act of receiving Christ's benefits and renewing his or her commitment to Christ and his people, thereby uh, making the church one body and marking it off from the world. Again, it's, it's a church's act. It's also a believer's act. Um, and, and as a Southern Baptist church, we believe that, uh, that it's a, a commemoration of Christ's death um, as, a, as a whole, as a church, we're doing that. But the believer, when you take that, when I take that, what I'm saying is I'm committing myself to Christ and I'm committing myself to you guys. And whenever y'all see me take it, I don't know if you look around whenever you take the Lord's Supper. Uh, maybe you do. Uh, sometimes I do. But, but it, it, it helps us to um, remember that that person is, is still repenting of their sins. That person is still believing that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so whenever we take it, there's, um, we're, we're saying we're still in this together. We're still committed to Christ together. And obeying these ordinances, we're publicly submitting and committing ourselves to the church. Um, an example of that could be that you know, a, a, a team, whenever they go out to take the field or, or, or um, take the court, they, they all suit up. They all get on the court, they all start doing layups or, or, or warming up, and all of them with their jerseys on, with their, uh, you know, sweating, they're all saying, I'm, I'm participating here, I'm still committed to this team, I'm still gathering here with you guys, and, I, and I'm ready to, to go to battle with y'all. 
right? And, and us, as the church, whenever we take the Lord's Supper and when we baptize, we're in many ways saying the same thing. I'm still committed to you guys, and you are still committed to me. Not only do churches obey the ordinances, but they link arms to fulfill the Great Commission. That's our third point. Autonomous local congregations observing the two ordinances of Christ, seeking to fulfill the Great Commission. I hope you know where this is at. If you don't, it's Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Some of you guys could quote this, Matthew 28, 18, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. As a, as a church, we ought, to know, we ought to know what the Great Commission is, and we ought to know that the church has a mission. We ought to be um, striving together to fulfill that mission. Every, every good team has a mission. If y'all have ever seen, y'all ever seen the movie Miracle, it's about the 1980s United States hockey team. I love that movie. Me and Lizzie have watched it a hundred times. And, and in this movie, uh, they get this new coach, uh, and, and he's, uh, he's kind of going against the grain, uh, nobody thinks that he's really the guy that should be in that position, and, and he's trying to convince everybody that the United States, lowly as they are with their hockey team, is going to be able to beat the Russian national team who's been the best team for like the last 15 years. And he's saying, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna use the system that they use, and we're going to beat them at their own game. Because they, they, use, they do have talent, but they don't use the best talent. They get people to operate within a system, committing to each other. They're all working together really hard for a common goal. And when you don't have any superstars, you've got everybody, man, they, they know that they're going to have to rely on each other. And he's saying, we're going to use that same system. He, he comes up with this, this awesome strategy. And, and if you, I hate to spoil it for you, but it's 1980, so you should notice by now, the United States beats the Russian national team. This awesome, um, you know, triumphant scene in the movie. Uh, it builds up to that, and then they beat them, and you're just like, man, it's so awesome. And it made me think, like, if they didn't have a, if they didn't have a mission in mind, if they didn't have a goal in mind, how would they have ever hit it, right? And as a church, I, I, I wonder if we are thinking uh, about what our mission is. We have the mission statement downstairs in the basement. We gather there on Wednesday nights, uh, and on the side of the wall there, it says that First Baptist Church Fairdale exists to... Proclaim the gospel while loving and serving both God and people. We exist to proclaim the gospel while loving and serving both God and people. I almost forgot it there. About to get on y'all and I'm forgetting it. Um, we exist to proclaim the gospel. We exist to want to make disciples. We exist to be uh, making disciples here at First Baptist Church Fairdale among each other, uh, helping each other remember what Jesus has taught us, helping to obey what he's commanded us. But we're also called to be baptizing, which means that we need to be um, in, in community with other believers or uh, with, with non-believers. We need to be uh, sharing the gospel. And as often as, as someone is making a profession of faith, we're, we're walking with them and helping them to, to get baptized and understand what that means and understand what it means to walk with Jesus and hate their sins. Nick Rourke and Robert Klein in the book Biblical Theology, they say this. They say that the local churches, that local churches are outposts and embassies of the gospel. Outposts and embassies of the gospel. Our mission must prioritize the proclamation of the gospel and calling sinners to repentance. I think as First Baptist Church Fair Enough, we preach the gospel, uh, we, we give to missions, we go on missions. As, as, a, as a whole, we're doing those things, but I want us to consider individually, how are we, how are we doing that? I want us to, to, to be challenged tonight about thinking, how, how, am, I, how am I at work, how am I um, contributing to us making disciples? Let's be a church who knows the mission and is taking steps daily to accomplish that mission. While we're fulfilling the Great Commission, we're doing that as we are led by our, our pastors and deacons. That's our fourth point. Uh, Southern Baptist churches are, are led by the two offices of pastors and deacons. Pastors, they lead our church in teaching and preaching, and deacons 
lead our church in serving. Every, every good team needs, a, needs good quality leaders. I think here at First Baptist Fairdale, we, we got arguably some of the best. Um, thankful for our pastors and, and deacons. In 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 13, 13 and Titus 1, 5 through 9 lays out for us the, uh, the qualifications of pastors and deacons. And again, you don't have to turn there. I'm not going to, for the sake of time, we're not going to read all of that. But just know that those two offices are the two offices that the Bible gives us for the church. Pastors and deacons. Um, both of these uh, roles um, in Acts chapter 6 are actually, you can turn there because we'll look at that. Uh, we can see both of these represented. Acts chapter 6, looking at verses 1 through 4, it says, Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose. Hellenists are just Greek-speaking Jews. Uh, it says that um, a complaint arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve apostles summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, who we will, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The apostles here, or the, the, the preachers, were saying of the church, were saying, we're going to continue devoting ourselves to the preaching of the word, <clears throat> but we want you guys as the disciples, as the church, to find some guys among you who can help to, to serve the church. And, and, and so call those guys up. We'll, we'll point them to that work. And now we, we have the role of deacon. And that, that started in Acts chapter 6. Uh, we also believe, as, as outlined in the Baptist Faith and Message, that both of these offices should be uh, fulfilled by men. Um, and, and, and that can be controversial. Um, this doesn't mean that women are not able to do anything or that they can't fulfill other roles. Uh, it doesn't mean that women aren't valuable in the church. In fact, in, in Acts chapter 18, uh, in, in a conversation that Priscilla uh, and her husband Aquila, they're, they're talking with Apollo, and, and he, his doctrine was a little bit out of line. And so both of them go to him, and it says that they uh, expounded the way of God more accurately. So she was helping her, her, her husband, or uh, together with her husband, rather, uh, was, was expounding the way of God more accurately to this, to this gentleman who didn't uh, fully know God's word or didn't, didn't understand something. And so in conversations and in Sunday schools and Bible studies, um, uh, women are, are, are certainly uh, expected and, and, and able to, to teach and, and help other men understand, help other people understand God's word. Uh, the Bible doesn't, doesn't say anything about that. Wayne Grudem, in fact, says that, that the question, the only question to be asked is whether any offices in the church include the ruling and teaching function. And if so, those are reserved for elders uh, in the New Testament. And again, elders, pastor, that's uh, a role that is to be uh, fulfilled by men. It's for, for male leadership. We've got... The church is autonomous local congregations who observe the, uh, the two ordinances of Christ seeking to fulfill the Great Commission as led by pastors and deacons uh, leads us to point number five, gathering together on the Lord's Day. The Lord's Day was the second section. It's uh, section eight in the Baptist Faith and Message. <clears throat> and the Lord's Day uh, is... The first day of the week, again, the, Southern, the um, Baptist Faith and Message says that. It's the first day of the week. The only use of the term the Lord's Day is in Revelation 1.10. It doesn't give us a ton of context. John, whenever he was on the island of Patmos, he doesn't say when exactly the Lord's Day is, uh, but we infer that the Lord's Day is the first day of the week whenever the church would have been worshiping together. Uh, and we see that in Acts chapter 20. I do want you to turn there. I do want you to turn to Acts chapter 20. And check out verse 7. It says, On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together. Gathered together. That means that the church was together. They were there for a reason. And look at what it says. To break bread. And then Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day. 
and he prolonged his speech until midnight. This was an evening service like we have tonight. I promise I'm not going to preach till midnight. We're going to be done here in a few minutes. But Paul was preaching really late into the night. And this was on the first day of the week. It's on a Sunday. So we're, we're, we're here. We're on a Sunday. It's, it's a Sunday. It's an evening service. And, um, and, and we say as the church that we, we worship on the, the first day of the week. One, it's to commemorate the resurrection of Christ from the dead. It's to commemorate the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Some people think that Sunday is the Sabbath, all right? And, and, and we don't have enough time to expound on all of that, but just as a, a quick way to kind of say that, the Sabbath traditionally is Saturday. It was the seventh day of God worked six days and rested on the seventh. If Saturday's the seventh day and Sunday's the first day, then Saturday is the traditional Sabbath. Sunday kind of became the day of, uh, kind of became understood as the Sabbath because in, uh, in the year 321, Constantine, he, um, he put out some laws or some rules that all businesses should close on Sundays. And so People started resting on Sundays and worshiping on Sundays, and, and so that just kind of became the day where people rested, um, but they also worshiped. And, and what we see here in Acts chapter uh, 20 is that if, if they were, and again, there's, there's some conjecture here, but um, uh, we have good reason to believe that they were gathered on, uh, they were gathered in the evening, and Paul was preaching until midnight because they were working during the day. So Sunday morning, they weren't going to church. They were, they were, they were working. Because Saturday, they, they were still observing the Sabbath and resting. So they had evening service. That's whenever they would have met. That's when the early church met. And that's why Paul was preaching until midnight. On this, John Piper says, This is why the early church took the first day of the week as its day of worship and turned away from the seventh day. This is really neat. Think, think about this. The seventh day marked the victory of the first creation. God rested on the seventh day, marking the, the victory of creation. The first day marked the victory of of the new creation with the resurrection of Christ. As believers, we worship Jesus on the first day of the week because we believe in the new creation. We want to commemorate his resurrection, and that's the day that we we worship him and we understand to be the Lord's day. Um, D.A. Carson on this says that the Sabbath was a day of rest rather than a day of worship, and Sunday became a day of worship but was not initially a day of rest. Again, going back to... um, uh, the fact that, that whenever we first had the Sabbath, it was not a day whenever the early church worshipped Jesus. Um, the Sabbath also in Scripture was seen as a day of physical rest um, initially. Uh, in, in Hebrews 4, 9 through 11, I want you guys to turn there and, and look at this. Uh, God told us to honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. We're to rest on the Sabbath day. But the author of Hebrews says this about about resting. Look at verse, uh, we're going to start in verse 8 here, but he says, um, For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. 11. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. What, what the author of Hebrews here is saying is that our, the, the way we enter God's rest is by belief in Jesus. We no longer have a day that tells us we need to rest on that day. As followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, our, our rest is Jesus. Jesus is our Sabbath. And so, so every day we are resting in him, knowing that we don't have to earn salvation. We don't have to work our way into heaven. We don't have to do a bunch of good deeds to, to get ourselves right with God. Jesus' work accomplished that on the cross. And by God's grace, by faith in him, we have that same rest now. And this rest is for all who are in Christ. For all who are in Christ. The universal church. And that's our, our sixth, point, sixth and final point tonight. And consists, the, the, the church consists of all true believers throughout all time. In Revelation 7 and Revelation 14, 
God's word says that there will be people gathered from every tribe, every nation, every uh, people, every language. And they're all going to be worshiping Jesus together. And, and, and this ought to get us thinking about whenever we're standing before the throne, there's going to be people who we've never, we've, never been, we've never even heard of that country. We've never heard of the tribe. We've never heard the language. We've never seen people that look like that. And yet they, they know the same Jesus that we know. They worship the same Jesus that we know. And, and the universal church describes all people throughout all time who have believed. Old Testament believers, New Testament believers, people that haven't been born yet that are going to believe in Jesus uh, unless he comes back tonight. And, and so uh, the church is, is, is a bunch of local congregations, but also uh, and spread throughout the entire world, throughout all time, but also um, as a whole is one church, one church in Jesus Christ under his lordship. Um, yeah, and so uh, and we, uh, we can see this too in Galatians 3.28. I think this is the last place I'm going to flip you guys to, and then we're going to be done. Galatians 3.28. We are all, here we go, we are all one in Christ. 3.28. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's no male and female. For, you're, for you are all one in Christ. The church of God, while it does consist of autonomous local churches, together we make up one people. One people who serve Jesus. And whenever he comes back, we'll be serving all together. And, and, and at that point, uh, there won't be anything dividing us, but everybody who says, the blood of the Lamb has covered my sins will be worshiping with us in heaven forever. The church of Jesus universally believes that Christ died on a cross as the sacrifice for our sins to cleanse us and make us right with God so that anyone who would believe in him would have peace with God and eternal life with him. In summary, the the church, according to God's word, as understood by the Southern Baptist Convention, is made up of autonomous local congregations who observe the two ordinances of Christ seeking to fulfill the Great Commission as we're led by pastors and deacons, gathering together on the Lord's Day, and as a whole consist of all true believers throughout all time to the praise and glory of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much again for tonight. God, we thank you that you have saved a people for your glory that would honor you and would, and would worship you for all of eternity. God, we thank you for the privilege of that, Lord, we don't uh, pretend to think that we deserve it. Uh, We thank you that by your grace, through faith, we get to be right with you and now serve as ambassadors of you. Lord, I pray that we would be people who seek to fulfill the Great Commission. We would seek to gather together regularly. And we would honor Jesus as we do that. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Sunday, uh, as, as us.